Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by the 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Learn more at Hyundai.com. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy, episode 212 for September 27th, 2013. Fiesta ST, best enthusiast car at the lowest price. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Mr. Mr. D, buonasera. (laughs) Buongiorno, Johnny. No, buongiorno, buonasera. How are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, I've been having fun this week. How about you? It's all good, John, every day. (laughs) Living the dream. Yeah, now that I've, you know, met big data in person. You were writing about that this week. Yeah. Big data. BD. <laughs> Before we get into that, and we will, we got to say, hey, Gary Vasilash. John, great having here. you back with us. Glad you're not Gary. doing the show in Italian. Cause yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might get left behind. That's guys. right. So Big Data, you were uh, writing all about that. You had an interview with Big Data, as I a matter of fact. had an interview with Big Data. Old BD li- lives in the Wisconsin woods and in his bunker, and he and his college roommate d- decided to invent it when they were smoking pot in their dorm room at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> it's a good story. <laughs> kind of a different variation of the garage startup. Yeah. What have you been doing, Gary? You've been out of well, town. Yeah, but b- before we get to speaking of big data, so two weeks ago on the show you were elsewhere and we were doing it, and um, it was Frankfurt. You were at Frankfurt. I was at Frankfurt, yeah. And um, so that was the day that General Motors had a launch in New York and a launch in Los Angeles for their SUVs, full-size SUVs. And so we sort of chortled about that because thinking, you know, when you think full-size SUVs, you know, the first place you think is New York City, right? I mean, it's, uh, and in LA, I mean, similarly. So um, the folks at GM actually sent me some big data <laughs> indicating <laughs> how absolutely wrong I was. So this is, a, this is a mea culpa. So looking at the Yukon and the Yukon XL, so the big one and the bigger one, okay? And so the, so the top five markets for retail sales for um, the Yukon so far, this is a, the big one, Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, and then non-specific area, number four, Los Angeles, number five, New York. Okay, so the top five for that one. And then for the big one, the number one market, New York City, and LA is number four. So I apologize. Yowza. I was wrong. The, the, data, but, you know, the data speaks, Peter. But, the data speaks. <laughs> Big data speaks. Big data. But, uh, you know, it's, they function as limos in New York. Ah, uh, they do. They do. But I'm telling you, there's a, there's a lot of SUVs in the city. There are. I mean, that you know, we've talked about this before. Uh, don't think that because so many people you may have met in New York City don't own a car that there aren't car enthusiasts there. Oh, yeah, I've written about Some it. of the most hardcore enthusiasts. Yeah, I've written about that. that. Right. There are. You have to be. Yeah. If you're but into cars in New York, you, you're hardcore. But it's surprising. Yeah. It's surprising Detroit isn't in the top five. It's not a big city anymore. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, so for the Yukon XL, it's number six. And for the regular Yukon, it's number 12. But where, where is Detroit? Are we even in the top? 20? Well, you know, when, when you say Detroit, of course, you're talking about the, the Detroit metro area, which is probably, a, I don't know, what, 6 million people, 5 million, something like that. So it's big, but yeah. it's not L.A., it's not New York, Chicago, Houston. Houston, you know, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on, you know. I mean, Austin's bigger than Detroit. <laughs> I, I wonder, what's D- Detroit historically in our lifetimes was typically like uh, the fifth and sixth biggest city in the country. Yeah. Now it's yeah. like 14 or mm-hmm. something like that. Right. So, but, but it just seems that that car city. would lend itself the, to. The metro area, of course, is much bigger than that. Mm-hmm. 
So speaking of uh, the news, <laughs> what do you guys make of uh, that's all over the the radio, the TV, the internet, and everything today of all these Japanese companies getting busted for price fixing? And, and a lot of that went down in this town. Uh, you know, uh, I'd like to say I'm shocked, but I'm not. I mean, I just, you know, they're part of the club and they talk. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just... Uh, it, it's an extension of kind of, you know, what they do over in Japan. And, you know, it's different over here. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, the thing that surprised me was that some of these companies were actually nicking Toyota and nicking Honda and nicking Nissan and nicking Mitsubishi. So it, it was, it, it didn't matter, yeah. okay? It was like, these guys are gonna, are gonna get it from whomever no matter how. And uh, um, the, I went to the Department of Justice website and uh, it's like a single spaced six page piece on the companies that were involved in the fines that they are paying. You know, here's one uh, that's paying 195 million, 103 million, 135 million, 190 million, 14.5 million. How long have they been working on this? Like yeah. five years? It's, uh, I don't know if it goes back that far, but it's been years. Yeah, and, it, and the thing, so, so in total, it's more than, more than $740 million in fines that are gonna be levied against these companies. And uh, That's a lot of fines. And, and according to uh, Attorney General Eric Holder, quote, these international price fixing conspiracies affected more than $5 billion in automobile parts sold to US car manufacturers and more than 25 million cars purchased by American consumers who were affected by the illegal conduct. So just think about that, 25 million cars affected and not affected in our favor. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's, that's why the automotive business is such a good business to be in. You just skim a little bit off the top and it's over millions of vehicles, it adds up to a lot of money. Yeah, nickel here, nickel there. Yeah. Pretty soon it's real money. Yeah. <laughs> Remember in Office Space, the movie where they had the, the little computer glitch, like the fraction of a penny mm. is unaccounted for, and they said, you know, we'll just take into account. And they figured, you know, might. Yeah, well, that was based on a true story because yeah. there was a couple of dudes or three of them, I think, that were busted at the Chicago Fed for rounding off the yeah. right. fractions of a cent and, and dumping it, it in their they account. They made millions. Like, they thought it'd be like twenty-five grand, and mm -hmm. then like a week later, it's three hundred and thirty. You know what that represents? <laughs> That's big data. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we have a recurring theme already in the show. But, and so Gary, maybe you know, there were a couple of other uh, companies, interior companies that got busted for something. No, that, that was the- But that's separate. But, but that was in Germany. But, yeah, what but was, was that about? They hadn't gotten busted yet. Their offices had been uh, raided. raided by the uh, German authorities. I hate when that happens. Yeah, and uh, uh, that was, I think it was Forcia and Magna were among No, uh, IAC, I thought. Or was it Forcia? Forcia. Whatever, I think that's yeah, what it was. Yeah, well, we shouldn't. Yeah, be speculating about who got busted if we yeah, can't get the name right. Yeah, but nobody got busted. Right. They just got raided. That's that's a difference. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, and Gosh, when, boy. when like, you're holding that party, you know, and the cops come when you're in high school, and you know, <laughs> if, if they leave and your parents don't know, then it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. So what else? What have what have you been doing this week? Um, earlier in the week, I was uh, down in Austin, Texas, driving the um, new. Um, Chevy Silverado High Country and uh, um, the, the Denali um, version of the Sierra with the new 6.2 liter 420 horsepower engine. And um, so basically these are now apparently, and I hadn't, I hadn't realized this, but um, Silverado, for example, had never had you know, the Uber trim package and now with the high country, they have their Uber trim package because uh, uh, apparently um, more than 30% of the light duty pickups that are sold in this country have a sticker that is in excess of $40,000. And so they're like, hey, 
we got to get our piece of the action. And so, uh, they, what they took did, them they so did. long? Well, that, that's that's I mean, a good question. King Ranch. I mean, Ford's got like yeah. about a, yeah, yeah. a half a dozen <laughs> well, high, high line. <laughs> Well, there, there are two big the ones. I, 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 I checked and and I just you know to see what to see what this would be. So you get the King Ranch, which is basically forty four grand for, you know. And they just showed the new four fifty. But that's Ranch. yeah, but that's heavy duty. These are light duties. And then there's the uh, F one fifty Platinum, which will set you back about forty seven, starting. And then um, the um, Laramie Longhorn, the one that you were referring to. Uh, that's closer to 45 and uh, a bargain. And then uh, Toyota's got two now. Okay, so one to go up against the F-150 Platinum, which is cleverly called the Tundra Platinum, <laughs> 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 which which basically starts uh, over over 44. Um, and then there's they use the, Platinum too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Man. And uh, then there's the Tundra 1794, which competes with the. Laramie Longhorn or the King Just Ranch. Just drove it. But what, what's the deal? What's 1794? What's the story on that? Okay, so Toyota built a factory in San Antonio, Texas to build its full-size pickup truck. Remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So apparently there was a ranch on that property way back in the day, which was established in 1794. So that's where it comes from. First ranch in Texas. Oh, Chip, the producer, just uh, hollered in. There we go. It was the first ranch in Texas. I thought it was a thing in San Antonio, but... Okay. Oh, but that's, you know, it's, it's hey, a ranch, but... instant Well, because, I mean, because these should've things... should have gone with the Alamo. It didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody in Texas. <laughs> well, they'll remember they it. They remember it. That's right. <laughs> what are you been driving lately? Um, I, I drove the 1794, yeah. as a matter of fact, and it's a, it's a vastly improved truck. They, they've made mega progress on it, but I'm also driving a, a Z71 Silverado right now, and I, I'd have to give the nod to the Chevy. It's a, a quieter, more solid-feeling truck. And, you know, I'm not putting the Toyota down. I'm just saying that, you know, back-to-back, -back, uh, the Chevy just feels quieter and stronger. Well, I, I think it's one of those deals where, um, you know, if, if you're a Silverado buyer, you don't even know that Tundra exists. And if you're a Tundra and Tender, you're probably not going to drive the Chevy. You know, and the same can be said for the Ford or the, the, the Ram. I mean, that's just the way these things in, work out. Intensely but, loyal. Yeah. And, and I mean, so I was basically, I, I was, I was a uh, week before last, I was in a Laramie Longhorn. And oh, my God, I mean, uh, how many cows gave up their existence <laughs> for that thing? <laughs> and and I mean, and not only is, is there leather everywhere, but these guys have gone like completely over the top in terms of having these elaborate um, sewn appliques on the seats. You know what I mean? It's just like, uh, you know, fan the best part fancy looking did. saddles. I was looking for Roy Rogers and Dale Lovins to yeah. get rolling in. <laughs> well, the new King but Ranch. But it smells like leather. Yeah. The new King Ranch, you know, did you see the picture of the interior? We have no, I haven't seen that. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, well, they set the bar. I mean, King Ranch set the bar, and now everybody went, oh, sure. you can do that? Yeah. <laughs> so now they're all piling on. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I, I also drove a Audi A8 diesel, mm -hmm. long wheelbase. Well, you like the A8. Oh, oh my God. Well, I mean, this, this thing's a battle cruiser. They, they, they should christen it the Scharnhorst or something like that. What a machine. What a machine. That's now, which a, diesel did they stuff in it? Oh, God. The, the three liter? Yeah, I believe yeah. that's right. That's their new uh, diesel engine is uh, the three liter. They have a Beetle convertible. I like the Beetle. I like, you know, the last Beetle I had was the Sport version. Mm -hmm. And I, it was just a big disconnect for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, get the GTI, mm -hmm. and then, but the Beetle convertible seems to work in yeah. context as opposed to the Sport Beetle didn't work for me, but the Beetle Convertible, it's Convertible, it was, I, I had one this summer to drive. I took it up to Traverse City. 29 grand on the sticker, 29. For a convertible, that's not unreasonable these days, especially if it says VW on the girl. <laughs> hey, I don't know if you guys saw uh, the TV show last week, uh, out of line this week, but it was all about propane. And uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I think this is really going to catch on. We had a guy who runs uh, the fleet of vehicles for the city of Flint 
they're paying with a federal tax credit 65 cents a gallon to fuel their vehicles now All right. and yeah. saving a bundle a bundle and uh you know i think they pay a buck 14 a gallon and then when you kick in the the feds uh tax but they said even if the federal tax credit goes away at a buck 15 they're saving a ton of money and uh they also were talking about how the the city of Omaha, Nebraska has got school buses converted to it. And again, they, they've converted something like 400 buses, saving millions of dollars, putting it right into the classroom. It's, uh, I, I think it's starting to happen. But for, for fleets. For fleets, that's right, commercial truck fleets. Because, you know, because presumably they have the same issue as CNG cars in terms of the tank being larger in order to accommodate a reasonable amount of fuel, which then means your your package space goes away, which um, came to mind because I was I just got out of the uh, um, Sonata Hybrid, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, for all practical purposes. I mean, it's just a there's no trunk space. It's, it's a Sonata with you know. I mean, you're in the car and it's just like, oh, this is a Sonata and it looks like a Sonata and acts like a Sonata and drives like a Sonata and then you open the trunk and it's just like, wow. I mean, there's there's real really a truncation of trunk space, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is surprising. So I mean, that's that's another thing right. that it has to be considered. But in commercial trucks, you know, body on frame, big frame rails, there's plenty of space to stick. Sure, it and as like Jeff Luke when he was here a few weeks ago was mm -hmm. was intimating, you know, that this is the sort of thing that you know you have a you have a light duty pickup truck. Well, you know, get the long bed and take part of it and put in this big tank and uh, carry your fuel, but. Because um, uh, what was it, Nissan announced today that for the Leaf down in Texas of all places and a few of the metro areas, what it's, uh, they, they cut a deal with a uh, charging company that for a year you can charge your Leaf for free. Yeah. And uh, so. Nissan's pulling out all the stops, you know. They want to make this, uh, this Leaf they sell have, like they said it was going to sell. They yeah. have to because Carlos's ass is hanging out in the breeze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and then Carlos announced today they got the uh, license plate for that um, semi-autonomous car in, 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 in Japan. Japan. Right. And, uh, and the number 2020, because But that's... that was only for testing purposes, right. right? Right. Yeah, see, that's the big thing, is everyone's, all these states and now a country, because in this country, it's been, what, California, Nevada, and I think Florida have made a big deal about passing legislation that allows autonomous cars to be tested legally. <laughs> I hate to tell them, it's already happened way before they made these laws. And, uh, you know, in this area, you know, as long as you have a, a Michigan manufacturer's plate, it's always been legal to run anything on the road that you want to. So uh, That's what they used to do in the 60s when the manufacturers, engineers used to come out to Woodward. <laughs> Were they M plates? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they would still get tickets, right? Uh. <laughs> yeah, that assumes they got caught. <laughs> well. I didn't know that. I didn't realize they were actually street racing with M plates on them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because back in the day, it's too hard now, but I, I'm telling you, 20 years ago, you could look at the plates and by the numbers, once you started to learn, you could learn which manufacturer, because right. they, they'd buy a whole bunch of plates at once, and you know, oh, this series is Ford, <laughs> this series is Chrysler, this series is GM. So even if it was competitive product, prototype you didn't know what the hell they were driving around in or whatever if you could see the end plate you could pretty much identify mm -hmm. whose it was right. well that was ancient history though but in the 60s there was no radar and woodward was poorly lighted after after birmingham it was where country the, where the real racing and they'd race up to ted's drive-in at square lake and yeah that's the factory experimental cars I mean, that's the NHRA made that class to accommodate the manufacturers who were running them on the street. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, lightweight cars and front clips and radical stuff. So, the good old days. Well, a fleeting, was, fleeting moment in mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. 15 cent again. Now anyone can show up and drive away with 600 horsepower, like, you know. It's nothing. Uh -huh. You know, well, I keep talking about, you know, this uh, present day Honda Odyssey minivan on a YouTube video in a drag race with a Ferrari 308. 
in the stinking minivan smokes it. Well, the 3i was like a, <laughs> not a good car. I know, but it's just, yeah. you know, you, you cannot buy a family minivan with under 300 horsepower. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's I mean, how much it's changed. You know, technology, um, tires, everything. The cars, you know, uh, I think, I remember my brother sat on the pole at Mid-Ohio in 1968 with a 140 flat. Now you can take a stop with a Corvette, race prepared Corvette. Now you could take a Z06, uh, the current car, not even the C7, and I think you're down into the, you know, the 20, low 20s wow. or something. No. I mean, you know, it's That's just, extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know what the number is, so don't write me, please. <laughs> it's considerably faster, like 15 seconds a lap. I mean. That's, that's stunning. And, you know, like well, today, you can get, the, the, look at the horsepower you can get. Yeah, I mean, and the cars are so good that, that they perform so very well that anybody can basically drive them, you know, including me. Right. I was, because last week I was driving the, uh, the new uh, CTS V Sport with the 420 horsepower engine. Hmm, same displacement with as that 6.2 uh, liter yeah. Silverado engine. Um, yeah, with, with all wheel drive and, and uh, yeah. magnetic ride control and uh, yeah, awesome. it was just, it was, you know, I mean, guess it, what? I mean, the car is so much better than I am. I mean, this is like, let's face it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and, that's where we are today. And you go back and drive some of the quote unquote hot cars of the era. And uh, they feel primitive. Well, they're primitive because they didn't steer and didn't stop. And the suspension was kind of eh, sort of there. Now, a few of them weren't, you know, we drive a properly prepared 427 Cobra streetcar. It's still fast in any language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, or a 427 Corvette, you know, properly set up. But, I mean, you know, you get in the GTOs and some of those things, and it was like oh, yeah. steering, suggested mm -hmm. steering ratio. I mean, yeah. It's because you were meant to go straight. That's why when the quarter car, mile at a time. That's when, why when David E. Davis and Car and Driver did the GTO versus GTO. I mean, you know, I mean, they brought a GTO that was sort of a GTO, it had like, uh, who knows how much horsepower. Right, and, and then when they didn't like the numbers they got, they made the numbers better. <laughs> but still, I mean, the, the technology today at our disposal just showing up. Our guest is gonna show a car that, you know, it's probably faster than a lot of cars back then. A lot, the F Fiesta ST. I mean, that's just what's happened. Yeah. And that, that's the perfect segue, in fact. Why don't we take a quick commercial break and bring our guest, John Davis, uh, who's with the, the Ford SVT we got here in the studio, and we'll do that right now. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. We took the power of a nine-year-old V8 and gave it the impressive handling of Firestone's destination tire. Now, moms agree, every milk run feels like a victory lap. So whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. AutoLine offers you one of the most effective ways to get your marketing message in front of the decision makers in the global automotive industry. Contact Stacy Eman today. So, John Davis, great to have you here with us on uh, AutoLine After Hours again. Thanks, uh, thanks for asking me, John. It's, it's great to be back. John, tell us what you do. So, um, I've got small cars for Ford. I'm the chief engineer for uh, our small car vehicles. That includes vehicles like Fiesta, which you have here today. Also includes Focus and C-Max. Cool. So, all the C... Based. C and B. Vehicles. Fiesta we actually yeah. label as our B car. Right. And uh, so yeah, B cars and C cars in that universe are, uh, are under my responsibility. Of course, working with our, our global team. So, Well, you should have been here uh, a week or two ago because we were just gushing about this Fiesta ST. <laughs> and I said, I, I think it's uh, the best enthusiast car at the lowest price that you can get right now. Yeah. You guys must be wildly happy with the way that the car turned out. We are. We're really excited. I, I think it's uh, for two reasons. One, it's built on 
the Fiesta, which in and of itself was a very good small car, a lot of fun to drive, uh, inexpensive for our customers. But we really wanted to build the ST brand, right? We got to introduce the Focus ST last year. A lot of people excited about really getting a performance-oriented car directly from the factory from Ford. And the ST for Fiesta really builds on that. And it brings a lot of the same elements that make the Focus ST fun in the Fiesta, a great car to drive, except it's a little smaller. I, I think it's actually more fun to drive. Well, that's um, the consensus, is that the yeah. Fiesta ST for the real hardcore driving enthusiasts is more fun. Why is that? Because I'll attest to it. Yeah, it is. But I haven't quite put my finger, put finger on why. On it. So it, 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 it's not as powerful, right? Um, so if you looked at true 0 to 60 times, you'd probably say the Fiesta ST probably somewhere between 6 to maybe 8 tenths slower 0 to 60. But it's all about the power and the balance. And the feel. And the feel, right? So it's, it's very nimble. It's got a much shorter wheelbase. We've actually quickened the steering ratio on the ST for Fiesta. So base car is about 14.3 to 1. The new car, the ST, is about 13.6 to 1. Um, but it's only about 2,700 pounds. It's got almost 200 horsepower. It's over 200 pound-feet of torque. I mean, what's not to love about that balance, right? So it, <laughs> from my perspective, it's more like a go-kart in a way than a larger heavier car, and it feels that way when you drive it. So it's, it's power to weight ratio that you, you work Power to weight ratio with helps. Lighter car with... Yeah, but I think, I think the quickness in the steering, the, and the wheelbase makes a big difference, and it does certainly feel more nimble. Um, it's a fundamental feel. I mean, yeah. Ford's worked a lot on that in their cars. I mean, there is, you know, there's a feel, which I've been trying to get at with manufacturers. I mean, there's a certain way manufacturers do things. You know, BMW has instrumentation a certain way. Mercedes does their thing a certain way. And it's nice to see Ford in the last meh, three years, you guys seem to really put, uh, uh, working on putting feel in your cars, which is nice. It's refreshing. I mean, in mainstream cars. But especially this thing. And that's been one of our hallmarks over the last several years. Started when, uh, you know, Derek Kuzak really re-energized our product cycle plan. And we focused a lot on what we determined our DNA to be. Uh, I had the pleasure of being in a job uh, prior that worked on um, formulating what our DNA was going to be. And steering feel, responsiveness, vehicle dynamics were really central to that. We started the effort in Europe. You referenced the, the words in our earlier discussion, feel the difference, right? That was part of a hallmark of setting what we wanted Fords to be like. We carried that over, broadened it into a global DNA strategy. And in spite of many customers really wanting, I'll call it a more traditional American feel, which may be somewhat soft and a little disconnected, our view was we wanted to keep a precise, much more fun to drive approach from a dynamics perspective, and it really comes through in the cars. And then when you take it into the ST, we actually have tuning bands that are specific to establishing what an ST needs to look like. And even from the standpoint of the RS that we had in, in Europe recently, what that differentiation needs to be as a level beyond an ST vehicle. So we really have a feel and a character that we want to deliver. Um, and you know, the ST for Fiesta is a, a great, uh, a great symbol of, of what that brand should be. Speaking of steering, how do you keep the car from having torque steer? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's the perennial it, it, problem. It still is going to have torque steer. But um, not massive amounts. I mean, it's, it's subtle. Depends on how much you're stepping into it. And, and how probably slick some the pavement you, is. How slick yeah, the pavement yeah, yeah. is. So um, you're, you're always going to have it. And there are some technologies, like on the RS in, in Europe, we use the Revo knuckle, which was uh, helping to offset it. But, um, you know, part of it is finding the right geometry and the right balance, um, but it's not going to be avoidable in the, in the Focus or the Fiesta ST, so you're still going to have it. But again, it's, you know, manage the, manage the fine details, um, do what we can. Electric power steering has been a great enabler um, to balance feel and um, other uh, steering noise and input. So uh, that's really a good tuning device for us. And that's the other element that's a hallmark of wanting to make sure that we're giving you the right feedback through the steering system in spite of it being an e-pass system. Going back to the steering too uh, for the moment, you are also putting uh, 
none all season radials on this car, right? You've got what we yes. would call here in the U.S. summer, summer tires. tires. That's right. And that's a huge, I think, element as to why the car feels so good, why it just bites into the turns, is you've got a decent set of tires on right. the thing. Right. Because in the U.S., you know, the compromise is always, you know, these uh, mud and snow, all yeah, weather kind of radials, and they're fine for what they're supposed to do, but that's not a... Uh, what you want when you want to fling a car around. Do you have a single source tire supplier or do you use multiple? Yeah, so, so the ST on the Fiesta uses exclusively Bridgestone Potenza. It's a 205 uh, That's so, funny, that's so one tire. sponsors, John. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was sweating bullets there when you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, so we, so we use uh, a single tire, and you're right, John, it, it's um, really important what the tire selection is. It, it, it really can make or break in some cases the character of the car. So there's a lot of work done by a vehicle dynamics team around tire selection. Also providing specifications to our tire suppliers that are narrower than the things that you're gonna find off the tire rack, right? So um, it's important as a part of balancing all of those elements. We go through the attribute. Obviously we want a ride character that's good as well, but, but you're right, we get a lot of uh, capability out of the tires. We do the same thing on the Focus ST where it's exclusively offered with uh, with a summer tire. In fact, even in the mainstream vehicle, on, on uh, our large size tire in Focus, we're using a summer tire. Um, and it certainly gives a, 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 different, a different steering character to the car. Well, I love the fact that we've got it here in the studio because it really helps me prompt questions to you. It looks like you've got a different front fascia on the ST model. You've got rocker spats running along the, the rocker right. panels. You've got a, a, a wing right off the back of the hatch. Looks more tucked in at the back, too, than I remember on the other Fiesta. Right. My question, though, is does the stuff really work? Can you cite what aerodynamic improvements those additions have made? So there's a little bit of aero in it, but it's not in efficiency per se. I mean, most p cases from the standpoint of sports cars, we'd be looking at downforce. Um, we're not planning on taking this car to 200 miles an hour. But from that standpoint, I would say the appearance elements are really the driver for making the differentiation. Uh, and of course you see a lot of the family resemblance in the Fiesta ST from the Focus ST and that's intentional as we build the ST brand. But you're right, we really wanted sort of a 360 degree differentiation versus the base car. Uh, and you're right, you hit all the highlights between the, the front end appearance, the rear end appearance, including the, the diffuser exclusively with unique 17 inch um, tires and wheels. Uh, and that carries also into the interior. Uh, I think the car you've got here today also has uh, Recaro seats. Yeah. Um, and they make uh, it feel a lot more fun to drive, and it God, really you hugs charge you. charge a fortune for that. It's like two grand to get those seats. And what do you get besides seats? They're heated, and what else? Uh, they're heated seats, and they're, you get the Recaro feel. They're actually developed in, in uh, uh, association with Recaro. Um, you get a great appearance along with it, and you they're, get they're a lot of... They're extremely well bolstered, I'll right. tell you. If, if you want to go Jim Connor, If you want to be hugged all night long, that's the go sit in Well, you know, uh, we talk about Porsche's optionless all the time, what they do. So, you know, more power to you if you can get it. I, I think, obviously, an enthusiast is going to want to check the box, right? Probably. Right. If, if you're going to take this car and do autocrossing and the like, you want to check the box on the right. $2,000. Right. Right. <laughs> And, yeah. and you're going to feel it, it'll, it'll uh, help you hug the road as it, the car hugs you, so it's a lot of fun. And don't ask anybody, just check the box. <laughs> go the car. Don't check with anyone, just go do it. So when we had the Focus our, our ST in here, yeah. it was this yellow kind of color, sort of mustard yellow or whatever. Yeah. Tangerine and it, scream. Uh, and, and every single one I saw on the road was that color. Was that all that you guys offered at the time? or how No, we, we offer more, but that was a signature color when we launched. And, the, and now we've oh, got this... Does, it's not even a lime green. I'm not sure what to call this. Yeah. We, what do you guys we call We call it Green Envy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's very similar to uh, a 911 color in the it 70s. And it, it, so it's, but it's, this one isn't exclusive to ST, uh, so you can actually get this on the base car as well. There is one color. It's called Molten Orange. It's right. a reddish-orange color uh, that we introduced uh, this year for, for the ST in the Fiesta, and that's uh, extremely uh, unique. So what did, what did you learn doing Focus ST that you went, aha, here's a few things that we can do, marketing or design or whatever wise? Well, at first there was great enthusiasm in the customer base for this car, right? I mean, they were really interested in, in something 
uh, set apart from the base vehicle. The, again, the base Focus has a lot of good uh, characteristics, including its ride and its handling. Um, but they really bought into all of the elements. They also, we've noticed that they wanted the added technology, the features that we put into the car, again, in base Focus that were showing up in high numbers, checking the box, if you will. Uh, and so that carried into the Fiesta ST. So for the first time Here's this year, we've, uh, we've introduced um, our My4 Touch system. We've introduced an electronic climate control system. Um, we've made other enhancements uh, in the vehicle for the features, both safety and comfort and convenience. Um, and they found their way uh, in high percentages into the ST. So, you know, it, it starts about 20 uh, 1.4 is a starting point for a Fiesta ST. 21,400. Yeah, 21,400. Does that include it, destination charge? No, so add yeah, 795. See? And I'll get you just <laughs> over 22 um, for a retail. And, um, but it comes very nicely equipped. I mean, there aren't too many options to select beyond that except for go after the Recaro package. Um, we have a, a Recaro, um, uh, or sorry, a Rado gray wheel and red brake, painted red brake package as well uh, for a few hundred bucks. It makes it a nice uh, appearance upgrade as well. But beyond that, you know, get a sunroof and you're ready to go. Are there any structural differences between this car and the base car? Um, no, pretty much the, the base car still serves this, although uh, Clearly the chassis has been not only tuned, but you could argue redesigned, right? We go to a cast rear knuckle in this vehicle. We go to much larger anti-sway bars. Um, uh, the knuckles in the front are actually changed to help support a different steering geometry so we can get the faster ratio. Um, that's most of where it occurs, but mm -hmm. the, the fundamental um, structural but characteristics are all there. Is, is optimized for what this car is going to be facing versus what that's right a daily driver is likely and you have four wheel discs and yep four wheel discs as opposed to drums in the back but it still rides on a, a twist beam rear uh, mcpherson up front so um, all the the base characteristics are still there i've always been amazed at how just a little bit of tuning on a car shocks bushings springs tires wheels can transform a vehicle you know it doesn't take a whole lot to take an okay car and really make it do right. something. But you have to have the structure that supports it. You do. Right? I mean, no, you do. You can, out, you can out tune the structure pretty quickly. And, <laughs> it, and we've seen it. I mean, that's a, that's a challenge. So you've got to have it in the base structure to make it uh, capable of doing those things. The single best thing about the car to me is its weight. I mean... It, you said what, 2,700? Yeah, the ST is just over 2,700 pounds. And you said almost 200 horsepower. Right. I mean, it's, so that's about... 13 pounds per horsepower. Am I doing that right? That's not bad. That's not bad. I just, you know, it's uh, when you drive a car that's uh, uh, engineered by enthusiasts and it's light, it's night and day. I mean, you know, let's face it. In the last 15 years, we've seen uh, weight creep in all our cars. Well, you know, safety standards and everything else. But, I mean, they're bigger and they're more complicated and they're heavier. So it's nice, it's refreshing to see a car like this. You know, it's kind of like the BMW 2002 of, of this generation. Yeah. That's what I think it is. And since we still use the same technologies that help us deliver the performance aspect, so we're still using one of our EcoBoost family of engines in this car, in this case the 1.6, um, we also get good fuel economy. If you want to drive it a bit more conservatively, right? Mm -hmm. So this still carries a 35 mile per gallon highway label. Um, now, if you drive it uh, heavy foot to the floor, you're probably not going to see 35 miles per gallon, but it, you, you can drive it conservatively and get great fuel economy. What's yeah. the transmission? So this transmission is a six-speed manual. It only comes with a six-speed manual. That's another good thing. Yeah. Um, so for the driving enthusiasts, it's uh, well aligned. Um, but of course, in the base car, um, we still have our power shift six-speed uh, auto. Um, as well as a five-speed manual that uh, and, and kudos car. to you guys too. Not only do you have the six-speed uh, manual in it, your heel and toe pedal setup is pretty it's damn pretty good. good. It's very easy to really go through the gears on this thing. Yes, it, it makes it nice and fun to drive. If you got the right size feet, <laughs> you have size 14s. Yeah, then may, that, then no, the, 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 you're probably not going to fit in the car yeah. anyway. Yeah. So, um, 
What other ST plans can you talk about or none? Uh, oh, yeah, that C-Max ST. We were wondering about that. <laughs> now, I was driving behind a car camouflage vehicle the other day, and it was clearly something that looked ST-ish. Really? Yeah. Well, we're going to continue to see uh, what makes the right fit, right, in terms to of expanding the brand. To be a fusion? Um, never say never. We'll, uh, we'll look at other segments and see how it fits in with the fold. It was a fusion with uh, dual pipes at the back. Was it? Hmm. Very interesting. Funny. Fine. And, there, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the RS program we had previously in Europe, of course, there's been a lot of public enthusiasm for us was, looking at the RS. So yeah, that's, um, that's another place to, yeah. uh, to look. But you guys will just have to, to wait and see. So, so does RS still exist in Europe with ST? Now, right now, there isn't an RS in production. So we're selling the ST Focus in Europe as well as the ST Fiesta, and that continues on. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, discussion around... Uh, whether or not an RS fits in our brand. And so, so is, is the European look. ST the same as the US ST, or do you have a different powertrain in it? Or? No, same powertrain, so same car. So it's the one Ford approach? To one Ford approach. Now, the only difference in Europe, so uh, from a configuration perspective, we do offer a Focus Wagon uh, ST. Um, and then for the Fiesta, uh, they do it exclusively in a three-door which we don't offer, of course, in the States. Ours is exclusively the five-door version. Now you're talking lighter weight still, I'm sure. Yes. But you know what? The, it's amazing. The character is still very, very similar in terms of the cars um, between the three-door and the five-door. I agree it's, it's nicer to have a little less weight in the vehicle um, all up, but, but they still, you can still tell how similar those cars are. From the other thing I like about the way that you guys approached it, same on the Focus, is if you want to put your foot in it and really go, it lights up. I mean, it sounds like it too. But if you back off, it's a quiet little car. Right. You know, so you don't have uh, you know exhaust and induction noise when you don't want it. And it's you've got what some resonator in the intake plenum. Is yeah, that we it? use what we call Symposer, and that helps enhance the induction sound. So as you step deeper into it, you're going to get that throaty roar that you're hoping will come on as the as the powertrain uh, starts revving up. It's cool, it works really well. Yeah. So these wheels are exclusive to this car? Yes, we only use them on the ST. You all can get, get them in, in this or a, a darker shade of gray, pretty much, so cool. Uh, one option. And then the, the other thing that's exciting, um, and we're still sort of in our launch mode for Fiesta this year, is, uh, and we've talked a lot about it, the little one liter uh, three cylinder engine, which we've had out in Europe in our small car segment. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have launched that in Fiesta for North America. And that's great because, uh, again, a lot of fun to drive. Uh, you get great power, but also get great fuel economy. And so um, we're expecting numbers even better than our super fueler. So we ended up at 41 miles per gallon for a super fueler base Fiesta and uh, obviously expecting to do better. In fact, we're in the midst of certifying with the EPA right now. so. Before too long, we'll be uh, ready to release our numbers. So if this is a 1.6, what is the current base engine in a Fiesta? Yeah, base Fiesta is also a 1.6, but it's naturally aspirated. Okay. So it produces 120 horsepower, 112 pound-feet of torque. Um, it's pretty well balanced, mm -hmm. again, for the car, because the base vehicle is around 2,600 pounds, a um, little less in the five-door form. So um, again, makes it very fun to drive. So it's a lot of fun. And uh, again, steering geometry and all of those things. Um, and I even think the one, the base 1.6 has a, a pretty decent sound as you even step into that car. And that's what our customers tell us. They, they really enjoy, enjoy driving it. And presumably the one liter is going to even take that mass down even more. Uh, the engine is light and that's uh, a good thing. Um, but the real benefit is uh, matching the lower displacement when you're not under boost we we'll get about 123 horsepower, but you get torque, including an overboost strategy, we have about 147 pound-feet of torque, so it's a pretty big move up. And that, again, provides a good uh, you know, power and torque balance mm -hmm. uh, within a, a relatively lightweight car, so lots of fun to drive. Hey, why don't we, uh, oh, you got a question Just there? one, yeah. Uh, yeah. the exclusive color that you talked about? Molten orange, yep. Will, will that Will there be a new exclusive color each year? Is that how you're going to do it? Uh, we tend to want to keep the product fresh, but as an example, the, the Tangerine Scream, we, uh, we let out run another year within, um, within Focus. Um, we'll play it, right? It depends on how much demand we see. 
as that becomes a signature color and as it resonates with the customer. Sometimes what we find if we change them too quickly, our customers get unhappy with us. So sometimes we do need to let them run a little bit Customer's longer. Customer's always right. That's right. Got to I like that. You know, Ben ran a little clip of uh, uh, the car with that color on it here. And uh, I mean, you know, I'm judging on a, on a screen, not looking at the car out in the sunshine, the proper way to do it. Right. But it looks pretty good. It, it, that color pops more than the, the tangerine scream does on the, the Focus. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great color. It picks up the light really well, and, and, and it's metallic, so it, 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 really, uh, it really shines. Hey, look, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in from our viewers right now. Why don't we take a quick commercial break and get to those? So, Ben, let's get to it. What's my type? Well, they have to be smart, uh, a good sense of direction, Good taste in music. And, of course, good looks. With nice curves. That gets my temperature rising every time we touch. And that exotic name, Elantra. Wait, are we talking about cars? Okay, this is the part of the show where we get to the viewers' questions and we answer them quickly. It's rapid fire. Ben? Show them what it's all about. Okay, John, we got a bunch of questions from you here. Steve B says, are any of the ST performance parts available in the aftermarket or any upgrades? Um, so, you, I mean, you could technically buy parts uh, from the ST side through our dealer network. Um, and of course, we still offer performance parts and racing parts right through our, our Ford network as well. So there are components that you can buy if you want to go out and attempt to create an SD yeah, on your what, own. Yeah, but, but it would be more efficient to buy, just yeah, buy it right out the do door. That? I mean, they spend all those hours and money and everything to get the car to where it's, I mean, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense right. to me. It's a better value to buy it as an old car. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> because you got an old car and you want to upgrade just it. That's why you, you do it. And right. I mean, you should. <laughs> Um, let's see, there was a question about the one liter EcoBoost. You already answered that. Uh, right Knight says, why no all wheel drive Ford Fiesta SVO TI EcoBoost two liter turbo? Too, too heavy. <laughs> I'd love to have it. I mean, uh, it, again, we could do it. I, from a technical perspective, you can always do those kinds of things. I think from the standpoint of the best balance and capability of the cars, this is a great balance in, in sort of this affordable space. Um, it'd be tough and, and from an affordability perspective to develop that, put it in. Well, I don't think know, we have good You know, that could go up it. against the WRX, True. you know, and you sell it worlwide, like you know. Sounds like a good rally just car. here. Right. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Sean Sweeney says, will the, oh, you already talked about the Fusion ST. Peter already saw it. He says, will Europe see a Mustang ST for 2015? You know, says Mexico sells a Mustang ST. Well, they, they have been labeling um, ST packages uh, actually more as S packages. So if you look at the new cars, uh, I think the S uh, design in terms of the nomenclature actually looks like the, the ST package. Um, but I think we've, we obviously have a, a pretty full stable of our Mustang pony cars uh, and from a performance model. Right now, you know, that's really the, the GT and the, and the Shelby. Um, we probably won't want to muddle that with an ST per se. This one I'm going to throw out to uh, Gary and Peter. Speedostat says, does the Audi Quattro look to you like it borrows heavily from the Camaro design? And, you know, the Audi Quattro, of course, is the, the concept, concept show car. At, uh, I think the sort of slab-sidedness has, has some of the, the Camaro to it. And, and then we have the lights that are yeah, kind of higher and, up at the and top. And also, that, it's, it's big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is big. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I was reading, you know, looking at it and seeing the release, I said, oh, and you can fit passengers in the back. Why? And so you can see where they you can see they link, lengthened it behind the B pillar more than it should have. You know, I, I, that, that's funny. I, I never, from that, we're looking at a top three quarter right now. It does not look like a Camaro, but that rear three quarter, I, I, Kind of see maybe yeah. what he's getting at. That yeah, I, I yeah. I don't see that. I'm not sure that they borrowed from Camaro. Because I mean, the Camaro was cut 
Look how chunky yeah. it is from the profile. It is chunky, right. That's interesting. Okay, here's another one. Uh, CB757001 from Twitter says, and I'll throw this to you, Peter. He'd love to hear what you think Toyota thinks of their current 24 hours of Le Mans FIA WEC program and Porsche coming to LMP1. I think Toyota's concerned. I mean, they had that embarrassment. And so give me some background, because I'm not familiar. To Toyota's going to be coming to the... the oh, no, they're in it now. The Le Mans series. They've actually been the Audi's only competition, because Peugeot pulled the plug on their program and walked away. Mm -hmm. So Toyota has a WEC prototype, just ran in Austin at the race there, and it's, you know, they're coming, but you know. It's a uh, hybrid, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like the Audi. But Toyota's got a problem because they can't, they had a huge embarrassment in Formula One where they spent $400 million a year and didn't. Never won a race. Never won a race. So it'll be interesting to see because now the competition ratchets up. Next June, the, the Porsche LMP1 car, the Audi. And apparently Toyota's going to keep showing up, so we'll see if they're ready to run with the, the intramural warfare next year. Uh, Alba wants to know, I, I'll, Gary, I'll throw this to you if, if you can answer it. The redesign of the Toyota Tundra is confounding to me, he says. Toyota chose to significantly increase the amenities of the cabin, but decrease the power and capability. Isn't this counterintuitive? To what the traditional truck buyer desires. Is that right? Did they just decrease power? Or no, they, they're keeping the same powertrain setup. Yeah, it's yeah. the same it's powertrain. The same. Okay. They, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't increase They it. didn't increase it like okay. everyone does, and I think that's maybe yeah. by not going yeah. more, you're going less. Yeah. And, uh, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I mean, it was, it was interesting because when I talked to the chief engineer about um, their powertrain strategy, and, and they were basically saying, you know what? If, if we can't show and prove value to our customer for what it's going to cost them to do this, we don't want to do that. There's, there's no point because he said that they're, they're, they're by and large people who are looking at the, the return on their investment if they're using these things at, as tools. Now, presumably, if they're using these things as, you know, these, these Luxo boats, um, you know, hell. Buy more leather. <laughs> right. We should invest in leather futures. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we've got a, a number of phone calls here, too. Uh, ben, let's bring in the first one. Hi, my name is Anthony, and I'm from the Los Angeles area in California, specifically the San Fernando Valley. And I really do like the, the FFT. I haven't had an opportunity to drive one just yet, and I'm looking to pick one up possibly by the end of the year or the beginning of next year. My question to your guests actually was the status of Mound Tune, the tuning arm from the UK of Roush Industries uh, coming to America and when the website was going to be uh, um, uh, launched because I was interested in not just getting a Fiesta but giving it a little more thump. I'm, I'm coming from driving a 2003 uh, Dodge Neon SRT4, which I had upgraded to stage three and put down over 400 foot pounds of torque and over 370 horsepower. So I sort of wanted to get a little bit more than what the standard 197 you got out of the Fiesta. Thanks a lot, and I love your show, John, and I always read your blog, Peter, so keep up the good work, and thanks. Thanks. That's cool. That's great. Yeah, what, what, what about Mountain? So I, I can't uh, tell you any timing or when those things will happen, right? Uh, we continue to work with, uh, with Roush as a close partner, as a part of our racing program, as a part of, uh, of course, they do their own upfits for some of our, uh, our vehicles and take great vehicles and make them uh, even faster and scary fast. Um, so I expect those things will be coming available in the future. One of the things that's uh, unique, though, to our ST customers um, for both Fiesta and Focus uh, ST is we're going to give them a shot at going to our Octane Academy uh, early next year. Um, and that gets you a, a chance to learn about the capabilities of the car, a little bit of, uh, I'll call it near racing uh, driving style capability. Uh, and so that's one of those added benefits if you, you buy into the ST family, uh, you can get these uh, added things from Ford. And where do you do uh, all that? So that's going to be done out west. 
Um, there's some details on our uh, website. If you chase it down through, it'll give you all the details about how you can sign up. But of course, you need to become a, an ST customer first. <laughs> okay, we got another uh, phone call. Ben, let's bring it in. Yes, this is Lake Lahue. I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. And I had a question for you guys. I was just wondering uh, when the uh, American automakers are going to adapt the DSG auto clutch type transmissions. I just find it kind of funny. You hear all these guys online talking about where it's being backwards, yet the DSG, I believe, was made by Borg Warner in America. So anyway, I was just curious if there's any more future plans and when, uh, like this focus says, we will get that. Thank you. Sure. Well, yeah, so the, the base, guys Fiesta, there. Oh. base Fiesta yeah, and Focus there. actually leverage a DSG or a, a dual clutch, uh, really a, a manual transmission within a lot of electronic uh, controls capability already today. That, that is our mainstream automatic, what we would call an automatic transmission for both Fiesta and Focus. Now, of course, it's, it's not in the ST products. Um, we're, of course, are looking at those technologies for the future and seeing, you know, whether or not that makes a, a good fit. For right now, obviously, uh, what I'll call cost-efficient, uh, fun-to-drive uh, sporting cars right now are going to come with manual transmissions, but those are clearly technologies we look at uh, in the future. And I think you guys are the only ones that are using. No, I believe, doesn't uh, the DART have a dual-clutch transmission in it now? Maybe. Uh, available. Available. That, that available. I don't think General Motors has gone with dual-clutch on anything yet. No. But, you know, again, part of the reason is uh, Automatic transmissions never happened in Europe forever and ever until all of a sudden DSGs came along, whereas in this country, automatics had always been very popular, and there's billions invested in doing it with uh, torque converters. So it's going to be a slow transition out of that, if it happens. Mm -hmm. But let's see, we got another phone call here. Let's bring that in. Hi, guys. This is Young Blood, Cleveland, Ohio. I got a question for Mr. Davis. What's the chances of a stripped-out, lightweight, one-liter EcoBoost Fiesta SD? Oh, it could be interesting. Good show. Later. Bye. Thanks for the question. Um, right now, again, not a plan to use the one-liter as a part of our ST family. Um, and there's nothing that says you can't uh, take parts out of your Fiesta ST and make it lighter to make it faster. Uh, but right now we are going to use that one liter as, uh, as really a fuel economy and a fun to drive liter simultaneously, which is why we're, we're going to introduce it in Fiesta. It plays really well in our small car segments in Europe already, so it's in the Focus, it's in the B-Max as the small people mover, and, and of course the Fiesta already in, in Europe. Um, and we expect it to proliferate, right? It's, uh, it's clearly a global engine architecture for us, and uh, you can look for it uh, in more of our cars in the future. Just think if you didn't have those extra doors, you could take those seats out back there, too. Exactly. There's no reason you actually have to carry passengers. <laughs> That's right. Kip on Trucking says, what happens if the OEMs don't meet CAFE? The fines have got to be cheap compared to complying. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think anybody would have that strategy. But the, the fines are a whole lot cheaper than Yeah, I think it's something it, right? like... Five dollars per tenth of a mile per car you produce. I mean, so it adds up. It adds it up. It could add, right? It, you produce several million cars, and it's you're like going to be talking to big money. You know, pretty soon, uh, it's big money. <laughs> <laughs> but our, I mean, our role from a manufacturer is, you know, and to our board of directors and to our shareholders, are we need to have a plan for compliance. So we wouldn't head forth in a, a plan not to deliver and be uh, compliant to the standard. Question for Peter. JB wants to know, what's your impression on the Alpha 4C pricing at 54 grand, and what's your opinion on those headlights and the 240 horsepower? Um, I think the car looks decent from the front, and then when you get around to the side and the back, it's just like they took the afternoon off. And um, that 54,000 is probably just going to be a suggestion because you know what's going to happen in the market. Yeah, I mean they're going to go. Transaction price will be Much e higher. easily ten grand more. So uh, you know, it's still a niche within a niche. I mean, I, I don't see launching Alfa Romeo with the four C. I think it's going to be like this little, little side light. Yeah, and, and, right. and when's that right. going to get here? Yeah, uh, so, it, it so just got delayed again. Twenty fourteen. <laughs> we'll see. 
JB also wants to know there, John, what's faster on a road course, the Fiesta ST or the Focus? So probably based on absolute power and, and uh, straight line acceleration is going to be the Focus. But throw in the right road course with the right turns and the right twists. And yes, that you, might you, be ahead. You, huh? you might be ahead on the field. That, that's so really... if you took that to Mid-Ohio, speaking of that course, which would win? Mid-Ohio would probably still be the focus. Yeah, yeah. Done, long straight. Right, long yeah. straight. But maybe Waterford Hills, maybe Fiesta, maybe it's, maybe. it's got a bit of a spray. It's pretty, Waterford's kind of tight, so that, yeah, you yeah, might have a yeah. shot at it. Yeah, just have to draft going down <laughs> the straight. That's all, keep up with them, get them in the turns. Let's see here. We've, we've got so many questions, uh, but we're, we're down to the end here. What would look good? Hmm. Let's see. Uh, uh, Andrew Charles wants to know, uh, maybe this isn't your line, but it might be your platform. He says, we've seen compact Lincoln concepts. Is there room in the lineup for a B-segment Lincoln? Uh, never say never. I don't have any new product details I can share with you, but we did introduce, uh, of course, earlier this year, the MKC um, uh, Utility Lincoln uh, as the concept. And so you can definitely tell, right, we're going to be migrating into more segments uh, and expand our Lincoln brand. Um, so again, we'll look and see how that plays and whether or not there's enough buying demand uh, to also build Lincoln. Well, real good, John. Great having you Thanks, John. on the show Thanks, here. Yeah, thank you, guys. Especially having the car here. And yeah. uh, anytime you guys want to loan it to me again, I'm all for it. <laughs> Great. We'll make sure that happens. Gary, good to see you, man. Peter. Yeah. John. Yeah. John. And Peter. And everybody out there. Thanks for tuning in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And by the 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Learn more at Hyundai.com. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.